So, uh, can we uh, all settle down? Uh, yeah, it's really a distinct uh, honor and a pleasure to have Manuel Blum here. Uh, nobody needs a big introduction, but let me just say a couple of things at least. Uh, so, so yeah, Manuel uh, did his PhD at uh, MIT, and uh, he right away did pioneering work in uh, recursive function theory and complexity theory, and when he went on to uh, UC Berkeley as a faculty member, he really, really did uh, amazing things on uh, um, cryptography and program checking. Uh, some people even regard him the father of modern cryptography for the school he created uh, with his students. And uh, he has all the major awards, uh, including the Turing Award and uh, member, uh, the fellow of all the major academies. Uh, but the most distinctive thing about him is the, the students he has produced, 35 of them, PhD, and, uh, and the huge blum tree of all his descendants. This is, uh, I, I've never seen a tree this big. So, uh, and and, and the, the huge discoveries that were made by people in this tree, uh, it's completely a legend. Uh, and uh, sometimes, uh, you know, when there's an outlier in some fields, of scientific inquiry or in uh, the arts and music, you know, like in, in, in music particularly, uh, somebody is far out, they call him the musician of musicians because when this person plays, the musicians come to listen, the top musicians come to listen. So I think Manuel is, is definitely the PhD advisor of PhD advisors. <laughs> <laughs> you are very kind, thank you. <laughs> Hi, so uh, this is the title slide, Can a Machine Be Conscious? Uh, Eric just said, oh, you're very brave to uh, look at that. Uh, that's true. When I, when I first started working with McCulloch and Pitt, I was a junior, that was 1958, in their neurophysiology lab. I said I wanted to work on consciousness. I said, no way. They not work on consciousness. But uh, in the last few years, we've learned quite a bit that I am trying once again, but my co-author is Lenore, and she really is a co-author with me on this. Okay, so uh, what is consciousness? So conscious, so I have to explain to you what consciousness is. I, I will, at some point I will get into the fact that what I'm really interested in, I'm an engineer. I, I mean, I, beca I became a mathematician, but really my, uh, my undergraduate work is in engineering, and the, the thing, as an engineer, I knew how to build robots that look like they are enjoying themselves or look like they feel pain. But you know, I knew that they don't actually, they're simulating it. They're not actually feeling the joy or the pain. And the thing about it is I knew in principle how to build a robot so it simulates, but I had no idea at all how the body is able to get you to actually feel these emotions. And that's the question that I will try to get to in, in this uh, talk. So in order to get to that, I have to tell you about consciousness. I, uh, so what is consciousness? So just quickly, what I mean by it is conscious awareness, what you are consciously aware of, and it's what you are aware of while you're awake or while you're dreaming. Of course, when you sleep, if you're not dreaming, you are not conscious. But if you are dreaming, you are conscious. And all of you have, are conscious also of some inner speech. You talk to yourself, probably in English, but maybe some other language. You actually talk to yourself, and I've spoken to uh, uh, deaf people who use sign language, and yes, they talk to themselves in sign language. They are aware of that. So, and, uh, okay, so, and I, in fact, I know that uh, my dog talks to itself because I can see it planning its day and deciding what to do. It has to talk to itself. In dogish, of course. Is that it. Okay. So my goal to understand consciousness and the long-term goal is to develop a computer architecture um, for exhibiting and explaining consciousness and qualia. Uh, I'm a theoretical computer scientist. I think it's really important to have a theory for this. Because otherwise, without a theory, it's going to be very hard to tell, is that robot really conscious or is it simulated? Does it really feel pain or is it simulated? 
So we need to have some theory to tell us. Uh, examples of consciousness, I don't want to go through all these, but uh, here's a typical example. Uh, you go to a party, it happens to me, you, I go to a party and I see someone and I know I should know their name, but only half an hour later to the Kieran. So it takes a while. So what's happening in that half hour? You're not thinking about it. You, you, you saw the person, you wanted to know their name, you couldn't remember it, you went off and you got a drink of wine, you talked to other people, and then pop, half an hour later, it pops into your head what that name is. That's coming from your unconscious. Okay. There is thinking going on, that's the unconscious thinking. Uh, conscious, un so the bottom one is interesting too. You know that uh, to learn to play ping pong, you must consciously think about it, right? You have to really think to figure out how to do it. But you also know that when you actually are in a tournament, turn off consciousness. Let, do it unconsciously. It's the, uh, what you're going to lose. Okay. So let me just mention uh, a brief history of consciousness. Uh, when, when I got into this field, I was not allowed to think about it. But in 1990, something called fMRI was developed, and we could see what's going on inside the brain. And that's made a big difference, and there are some wonderful neuroscientists, uh, and these are the names of many, but not all of them, who've done great work in trying to understand consciousness. So here's the puzzle that I mentioned to you. Uh, I was an undergraduate in engineering. You see, I'm pretty old, uh, before you were born. And I wondered how the brain can create the agony of pain or the ecstasy of joy. I knew how to simulate pain, but the creation of real pain was beyond me. I was really stumped on that. So it raised the question, is there a difference between simulated pain and real pain? And uh, I will argue that the answer is yes, there is a difference. I've talked to people who say, it's just an illusion. You don't really, it's not, pain is not really real, it's an illusion. But you know, when I hit my thumb with a hammer, that's no illusion. That hurts, and it's no illusion to me. And my answer is yes, that there is a real difference. Agony is not an illusion. And the goal I have is to explain the difference between simulated pain and real pain in concrete engineering terms. Because I'm still that engineer who wants to build the robots that really feel. I'm going to deal more with pain than with joy because I need consciousness to explain pain, I need pain to explain joy, and then we can keep on going from there. So where do I come from? The question is, can a machine be conscious? And um, yes, I, we, I uh, believe it should be possible to build a machine that experiences consciousness, conscious awareness, free will, nothing really funny about it, strange about it, pain, the torment of pain, joy, like the joy of discovery, and the machine is to really experience these qualia, as they're called, uh, not just simulate. So uh, the view of consciousness here is that consciousness is a property of all properly organized computing systems whether made of flesh and blood or metal and silicon. And of course, I do talk to some people who say, you know, flesh and blood, you, it has to be flesh and blood. You will never get metal and silicon feeling <laughs> love. And uh, so if, if that's the case, then you're not gonna enjoy this talk at all because I am <laughs> certain that I get the, 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 that. So, okay, so the conscious machine, let me say that the conscious Turing machine, I call it a, a CTM, Conscious Turing Machine, defined here, is at best a gross simplification of a real brain. At best. It's, it is related to a real brain somewhat the way a Turing machine is related to a computer. You know, they're not the same thing, but the Turing machine is intended to help you understand what a computer can do. We're not trying to get an exact model of the brain. So the you, the neurophysiologists, are not going to be necessarily happy with me because what I produce is not a real model. What I, what I do is I read everything that the neurophysiologists produce, 
And they have decided pretty much what the architecture of the brain is. They seem to be in agreement there. Uh, not all of them, but most of them. And what I do is I want to take that architecture and produce for you uh, something that really could be, in principle, could be built. Uh, uh, true architecture. Uh, the, it's not going to be the brain, but uh, the goal is to understand consciousness. And I want to make clear that in what I speak, uh, I want to distinguish between the model of consciousness, the conscious Turing machine, and the real brain. And I'll make this mistake of making it unclear sometimes, which, but that's my mistake. It should be clear when I'm talking about the real brain and when I'm talking about the, uh, the model. So the fundamental extraordinary idea for explaining consciousness. Actually, it goes back before Bernie Bars. Uh, there's a Frenchman named, Ip, I don't speak French, Epolite Ten. It looks like Hippolyte Ten, but uh, here, I should have asked you this beforehand to, to help me with this. Anyway. Uh, Eppoli 10 had this notion of consciousness as being what's going on in the stage. There's a stage and an audience, and what's going on in the stage is what you're conscious of, and the audience is an, is an audience of processors, many, many unconscious processors that are looking up at the stage and paying attention to what's there, and when you ask, what's that person's name, somebody in that audience is going to know, will find in its memory what that name is, and send, shoot it back up, okay? So there is, I call it Bar's Theater of Consciousness because although Epoliten did come up with this idea first, Bar's actually tried to create a model. And uh, here is Bar's model of consciousness. You see, uh, at the, you see this central executive over here? Uh, it's, if you think of finite state mach uh, of Turing machines, you know you have a finite state machine at the top and then this tape. Well, that central executive is the finite state machine and the Turing machine. And then there's inputs on the left and outputs on the right. And there's this working storage, which in fact is what we are conscious of. And then this whole long line of uh, unconscious processors that do things in ways that we don't know. They, they, they do stuff. Okay, so that was Barr's kind of informal model. I want to make that formal. I want to be able to prove theorems. I'm a mathematician too, so I want to be able to prove theorems. So uh, let me try to give you that model of uh, what the conscious Turing machine. So more formal, still not completely defined, but you'll enough so I can explain uh, at least what, what my understanding of these goals. So here's the conscious Turing machine. I do have external input on the left. The short-term memory, often called working memory, uh, which is what we are conscious of. It's what Bernie Bars calls the global workspace. And there's external output. And I'm, um, uh, uh, let's see, oh, well, yeah, okay. So uh, the yellow denotes conscious, and I'm sort of saying that what's the input is conscious to some extent, not completely. You know, when I show, I started off and saw this picture of the upside down house, you do sense that you are conscious of that upside down house. But the truth is, uh, you are conscious of what you pay attention to. Uh, attention is very important. And unless you pay attention, you may not notice the, that there is a dog house there or uh, a sled, you know, there, there are many, this thing, this, this house is in Moscow, all the furniture inside of it is upside down, it's pasted to the ceilings, uh, this is a real thing, it's a great tourist attraction. Anyway, you are conscious, you seem to be a conscious of the whole thing, what you feel you're conscious of is really what you can be conscious of if you pay attention to it. And then there's the output where this output is really interesting because you can, you, you remember, well, you've seen kids, you know, little babies who discover their hand, that they can move their hand. Isn't it wonderful? They discover and curse of them to try the other hand, and that works too. And then they might try your, 
their mom's hand and the mom's hand doesn't work. But you remember that you wanted, you wanted to be able to do this. You wanted to be able to take that rock and lift it by the power of your mind. And you can do it because in your, uh, your working memory you have a model of yourself, you have a model of that rock, and you can try to lift that rock in your head the way you lift your hand. And, uh, to the, and you don't know whether you can lift that rock until you look at it. So this external output is right only. You, you, you only can tell what's going on there if you actually use the input to see. And of course we can't do this much as we would like to be able to do what Yoda is doing here. Okay, so I'm going to present this model so I can get to the, my questions about pain and joy. So here's the model. Uh, let me just mention here that all, all of this is dynamic. But I'm especially pointing to the external input because in a Turing machine that external input is fixed. It's on a tape, it's fixed. And here it's dynamically changing. And, you know, everything you see is constantly dynamically changing. It's all dynamically changing. Okay, conscious, unconscious. Oh yeah, so you see I've, I'm trying to suggest lots of processors and each processor with its memory. Processor for faces, a processor for speech, actually many processors for each of these things. The whole cerebellum is concerned with fine control. More than half of the neurons in your brain are in your cerebellum. Fine control. And memory, fear, fear anger, etc. And this next one is just to say that this keeps on going. There's unconscious processors, there are a lot of them. Virtually every neuron is a processor. Okay, so there's where we are. I'm now, uh, you understand what I'm doing? I'm trying to now present the model, and uh, which is not really my model because it's what the neuroscientists tell me is going on. And uh, part of that is there is this fast broadcast. Whatever you are conscious of is broadcast to all of these processors, these unconscious processors. You understand what I mean by broadcast? I don't mean like radio waves. I mean, of course, that uh, th I have here a binary tree. It's probably much more an energy tree. But very quickly, what's up there is received by all of the processors. They all know <laughs> what's going on there. Okay? And by the way, uh, there's often been this question of why is short-term memory so small? Seven plus or minus two chunks is what George Miller told us. Seven plus or minus two. It's the reason that, that our telephone numbers were originally seven digits because it's hard to remember ten. And if you don't know the area code, if you have to remember ten digits, it's, it's a problem. With seven digits, you get the digits, you can go off, find a piece of paper and pencil and write it down. So everything that's in short-term memory has to go down to long-term memory. Why only this very small short-term memory? We could make it big, right? But if you made it big, then some processors might pay attention to some part of that short-term memory, and other processors might pay attention to a different part, and we don't want that. We want all processors paying attention to exactly the same thing. So short-term memory has to be small. So there's the broadcast very fast, boom. And then it goes the opposite way. Uh, the, these processors will look at what they're being asked to do, or uh, the questions that are being asked, and the information so more slowly works its way up to the top. Question? Yes. If you're looking for fast broadcast, would you really use a tree or some other architecture for the interconnections? I, I you know, what, what else besides a, a tree? You could do um, a full interconnect, because in the brain you're no, seeing... No, no, you can't. Full or, or some version of, of that where you, you gotta be not, careful not like a lot of more connections. Fan out of two, but you could have a much wider fan. Oh yeah, yeah, I'm sure it's much wider. I'm 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 just saying I'm just trying to say with this that, you know, it, it's log depth for the, for end processing. I'm I'm sure you're absolutely right there. So okay, and uh, I've been working lately also on how that information goes up. Um, my current best thoughts on this is that 
these uh, processors, the, something like pain, that these things, these processors have information that has to go up, but very little information can get to the top. And somehow, the, on the, in the nodes along the way up, the decision has to be made. Do we go with this, or do we go with that? And so I, I attach integers, like minus five in this case, to the pain. It's just minus five, but if, you know, you have lots of uh, nociceptors, these nerves that r recognize pain, and if only a few of them are firing, and at a low frequency, you have only a little pain. If a lot of them are firing, and at high frequency, you have a lot of pain. What weight you asso associate to pain depends on how many fibers are firing, how fast they're firing. And similar thing for joy and fear, and what I, ha I do is, on the way up, I just have these numbers, and uh, I add them. So the, the bigger one, pain is, the, the one with higher magnitude, in this case, pain, uh, pain has magnitude five, joy has magnitude three, so the pain goes up, and it goes up with the sum of the two, minus five plus three, minus two. Another yes? Question. Is this um, architecture meant to imply that the processors do not interact with each other? I'll get to that in a second. You're absolutely right. The, the next one, I, I hope, starts, will start to show. Oh, you see? Interaction. I, I, I'll get to that. Uh, so, uh, uh, okay, so uh, you, you understand how this, the, the, the thing of absolute magnitude goes up, pain minus two, fear minus five, the fear goes up, but the fear now goes up with uh, the sum, minus two, minus five is minus seven, so it's strengthened by this. Um, it, the, you know, this is the sort of thing you can test. You can say, if you have something which is very painful, according to this, and you have something that's joyful, they, the two should subtract. Right? You should be able to test them, because I'm saying that the pain and the joy, the, the numbers basically add up. And uh, so there is evidence that, in fact, uh, uh, pain and joy do subtract, so that joy will reduce the pain. But I, uh, let's keep on going here. You mentioned, right, the connections. So, you know, there are so many processors down there, you cannot have everything connected to everything else. Uh, there's just too much. You, uh, you, you know, it's, uh, uh, n squared is much bigger than n, and there are n processors. <laughs> so here's my thought on how, you, how we're going to build it. Uh, when a processor asks, uh, asks a question, like what's that person's name? Or, in this, or maybe uh, the processor comes up with uh, the face, and another processor that's seeing this says, uh-oh, be careful with this person, fear. So they are communicating up there in the short-term memory, up in the working space memory. But when this communication occurs, th then, then you could draw actual links down below. So I'm going to put in links down here just when uh, processors are calling on other processors or talk to other processors. And with this, you, can, you, you, will, you don't have to have this huge, completely interconnected um, stuff at the bottom. Okay, so that's my summary slide. Uh, that's the picture I have of uh, the conscious Turing machine. You'll notice, by the way, there's no finite state machine in this. So unlike Bernie Bars, who has a, some sort of central executive at the top, no finite state machine. Uh, Everything is down below. If there, if there is something like a, a processor that's, if, if there were a finite state machine, it would simply be a processor down below, which is handling what goes on on the stage. Uh, yeah, I just have a quick question about the creation of like um, permanent interconnections. Um, is that a appropriate and realistic analog to the um, human brain? Because if something were to be queried, you know, extremely infrequently, would it be worthwhile to make a uh, permanent no, connection no, or should it no, decay over time? No, no. But in the formal model, I will put that in. That's the case. That's when it, it gets in, in the formal model. So again, this is a very good point. This is not the way, uh, the real brain. This is just my model of it. Yes? What is the cost of creating those links? 
I'm not going to get into that. Uh, it's a good question. I won't get into that. Okay, let me tell you how this conscious Turing machine, an example of how it works. You, you, you know this guy, Oliver Sacks? His stuff is wonderful. You should read his stuff. You will enjoy it. It's, it's really great. And he has a story about taking a hike in the Swiss mountains. And he says he was way up there in Swiss mountains. He came to this fence, and there, on the other side in the field, there was a sign that said, beware the bull. Well, he looked, no bull, so he went into the field. And he says that uh, he walked in for a while, and suddenly, going over a little crest, he saw the bull. And he saw the bull getting up on its haunches. Uh, this scared the living, living daylights out of him. And he turned around and ran as fast as he could to get out of that field. Okay? It was only after he had come out of the field that he discovered this enormous pain. He had torn several ligaments in the leg. He had not noticed it. He had used the leg. And only when he was out of there did he suddenly realize, oh my god, I can't walk. He just stopped right there and uh, he, he couldn't keep on going. So this is a case where you have uh, uh, Oliver Sacks. Uh, you, uh, the, fear, the fear comes up first. It gets up there on the stage and the, the pain can't get up on the stage because the fear is demanding completely every all control. But as soon as he's out of there, the fear goes down, the pain goes up, and then he really notices the pain. Okay. So what accounts for consciousness? So I'm going to say it's the architecture, this tiny short-term memory, which is, according to George Miller, holds just seven plus or minus two chunks, uh, an enormous long-term memory, and that the contents of short-term memory are steadily broadcast to all long-term memory, and the long-term memory processors negotiate what information to send up. Okay? And then how does this account for consciousness? So here's the first place where you have to, where you may or may not go with me. But the point is that every single processor in your brain is aware of what's going on in short-term memory. It's aware of what's going on there. It's a very small thing. If it's pain, every single processor there is aware of this pain. And when every single processor in your brain is aware of it, that's your consciousness. That is what you are conscious of. You okay with this so far? How many can you Yoshi lose? is not so sure. How many, what? how many can you lose and still have consciousness? I'll, I'll get to that. That's a very good question. It's good. Uh, you can lose quite a bit, actually, mm -hmm. as you know from HM and stuff like that. Okay, so we'll get to that. So here, in fact, here it is. I've wondered exactly your question. What's your name again? Small. Steve Small. Steve. Steve Mall. M-O-L? Small. Small. Yeah. Thank you. Steve. Okay, so I've wondered about this. You know, what can you lose and what not? The stuff in green is demanded by the model. I haven't gone into it enough, but there are three things that you must have in the model to be able to, for, for, to have the model. You need to have inner speech, because that's how you do planning. You need to have that. You need to be able to have a, a copy of yourself. You need to have yourself so that you can decide, can I move that arm? That's self-awareness. And there's a third thing you need. You must be motivated. There must be something called motivation, which I view as the desire to do something and the energy to actually do it. So intuitively, those are the three things in green which you need to have. I don't know about procedural memory creation, but I can tell you, you don't need to have a lot of really important stuff. Declarative memory <coughs> creation, language for outer speech, you don't have to have it. There are people who don't have language for outer speech and they are fully conscious. There are people who cannot create new declarative memories like HM. What was that? It's Henry Malaysen is the name. HM could not create new memories. 
uh, the people who studied him would come on, come in every day. They'd have to introduce themselves anew because he simply could not remember. And so, and yet he was conscious. So I can say you don't need to have that. You don't need to have face recognition because there are people who, because of damage to a place called the fusiform face area, can't recognize faces. They look in the mirror and they don't recognize themselves. They don't recognize their spouse, they don't recognize their kids because of this damage to this particular part of the face area. Um, the various emotions, fear, you don't, there is a processor that, especially one process, processor called the amygdala that's especially responsible for fear. And there is a, yes? Well, well finish the sentence and then I have a question on the slide. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I just, of the green ones, which ones do animals have? I think they have all of them. Uh, certainly, I'm pretty sure that dogs have it. They don't speak English, as I said, they speak dogish, but they have a way of planning. <laughs> they can plan, and they certainly have a model for themselves because they can put themselves somewhere. And they have the motivation, and I can give examples where, you know, they are motivated. But they don't have inner speech. They have inner speech. No, it's just, it's inner dogish, it's inner, it's a visual. I'm not, when I say speech, I don't mean this. It's sort of like uh, the person that's uh, deaf and dumb who uses sign language. The, I don't know how the dog does it, but the dog certainly has images. The rat that's going through a maze certainly ha is able to plan which, where, where it will go. This is, inner, this is what I mean by inner speech. Uh, you don't like that. What would you call it? Maybe like a system of signs is what you're talking about. Uh, it, it is something. It, I call it inner speech, but I mean by that something very broad. It could be these uh, images that we have. Yes? Are you differentiating between like an internal monologue where you're speaking to yourself in English yes. and where you're thinking in concepts? Well, the, thinking, thinking concepts you know, these animals that don't speak English or, uh, you know, they don't actually communicate, they certainly are able to plan. They have a way of saying to, saying inside of themselves of what they want to do and how to do it. So that I call inner speech. I have a very broad notion of inner speech, the ability to plan. And the self-awareness for animals? Means and the self-awareness because these animals, they have a, a model of themselves in their brain and if you lose that, you do, these people are in serious trouble if you can't distinguish yourself from the rest of the world. Self-awareness means being able to distinguish yourself from all the rest of the world. If something is created with uh, <coughs> consciousness as defined here, is it possible for it to lose it later on in its existence? Uh, well, yes, it's possible to lose it. Uh, one, one thing I've discovered is that there, uh, these people with Alzheimer's, even in the latest stages of Alzheimer's, have those three. They have inner speech, they have self-awareness, they have motivation. Even very, even very late into Alzheimer's. So. The only thing I'm not sure about is procedural memory creation, because this fellow HM who was not able to create memories still could learn. He could learn to type. He didn't know he could type, but they put a typewriter in front of him, and they say, please copy this, I can't type. Well, give it a try. Hey, I can type. It's just wonderful. That, yes? Um, I just have a question about um, reconciling the desire portion of motivation with non, uh, with emotions not being necessary. What is desire if not some amalgamation of emotion? Uh, 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 good question. I have no idea. De desire. <laughs> desire. They, there should be something that you want, like fame. Uh, food. Food is very common. People and robots will need food. People need food as we know it. The robots will need to get charged. There, that's, you can understand desire for that and the motivation, the energy to go and get it. That's what, that's what I mean by it. Okay, let's keep on going here. So I'm now gonna try to explain a few things. Free will, I'm gonna go through it very quickly. And then the emotions of pain and joy. And finally this motivation which you asked about and I'll get to it. Okay, so the paradox of free will. How am I doing on time here? Okay. So, let me first met, have you wondered about free will? You ever wondered about free will? The fact that isn't it strange that uh, 
according to Newton's laws, everything is determined. How can you have free will? How can you actually decide something when everything is completely determined? So I, with the next few slides, I hope to explain that, right? Uh, but let me first say that the problem is an old one. Here is a beautiful, uh, uh, Lucretius wrote this poem, De Rerum Natura, it's the only thing that survives of what Lucretia did. And I remember reading this more than once when I was uh, a junior or senior in college. And uh, this particular paragraph, if all movement is always interconnected, the new arising from the old in a determinate order, if the atoms never swerve so as to originate some new movement that will snap the bonds of faith, <coughs> the everlasting sequence of cause and effect, what is the source of the free will possessed by the living things throughout the earth? This, I, I, this is wonderful. Look, this is a 2,000 years, 1,500 years before Newton. And here he's talking about if the atoms never swerve so as to originate some new movement. And this is way early. This is absolutely amazing to me. And here's another, in this case, this is Samuel Johnson, who was living just after, the, towards the end of Newton's life. And he has this beautiful statement, all theory is against the freedom of the will. By theory he meant Newton. That's what he knew. Newton's laws are against the freedom of the will. All experience is for it. It's a wonderful paradox. How does one explain that? So, and then uh, I guess Laplace down here, from the position and velocity of all the atoms in the universe, the future is completely determined. Uh, of course, nowadays you have quantum physics, but that doesn't matter. I mean, the point is that in quantum physics, the probabilities are determined. Maybe you don't know exactly uh, when that atom will burst, but uh, the probability of bursting at any moment is well defined. It's just uh, you picking samples. This, this is still true. <coughs> okay, here's the solution as explained by Dehaney. Mm, those great things. Uh, I hope this will clear, clear it up for you. Our brain states are clearly not uncaused and do not escape the laws of physics. Nothing does but our decisions are genuinely free whenever they are based on a conscious deliberation that proceeds autonomously without any impediment, carefully weighing the pros and cons before committing to a course of action. When this occurs, we are correct in speaking of a voluntary decision, even if it is, of course, ultimately caused by our genes. And uh, let's keep on going. Uh, also, l let me just say uh, my, uh, what this means to me. You know, you play chess, and uh, usually when I play chess, at some point I see, it usually comes down to I can either do this move or that move. And I don't know which would be the better move. I have to, if I do this move, what, how will, what will be the response, and how do I respond to that? What will be the results of doing this move? And then if I do that move, what will be the results? And you probably don't, you can't always figure it out all the way to the end, but then suddenly it, it's time to move. You've got to make your move, so you take the best move you have. So free will, the ability to consider both all these possibilities, and then of course when you make your move, you lose that free will to make that move. Okay, that's free will. Oh yeah, no randomness, no quantum physics in this. Uh, yeah, I could go into this some more. Okay, so uh, the next question asks how to engineer a machine. So this is what I wanted to get to. How it, so it really feels, not just simulates emotions. And for my argument to convince you, I need you to accept, first of all, that a physical explanation for consciousness is possible. Now I lose people when I say that because there are people who just don't agree. Well, if you don't agree, that's it. But I require that. And also, at least for the duration of this talk, I would like you, for the sake of argument, to accept the cre this conscious Turing machine as a credible model for consciousness. At the end of the talk, fine, you can go off and, uh, and question me, but just in order to understand, uh, um, do that for me. So to start, I'm going to consider physical pain, uh, because it's a very tangible qualia, 
and uh, um, for me at least, the simplest to explain. And uh, so the question is, how would you engineer a machine to feel pain? Now, a lot of people don't like this, and they ask, like, why would you engineer a machine to feel pain? You know why? You know why? Because you, that machine is expensive. You want it to be able to take care of itself. You want it to feel the same pain that we feel in order to take care of ourselves. It's important that the machine feel pain. The wonderful thing about pain is that if you understand it, you could make it so the machine feels pain when it, when it sees you in pain. I mean, we, to some extent, when we see somebody in pain, we do feel it, but it's not as strong a feeling as when our thumb is hit with a hammer, but you could make it so that the machine actually feels that enormous pain. So we could actually do ourselves a favor by building machines to, 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 to do that. Why would you engineer a machine to feel pain? There are good reasons. So, to understand the problem of simulating versus experiencing pain. Uh, this, is, this is wonderful. I, I'm, this is one of the reasons I wanted to deal with pain is that there are a group of people that uh, are aware of pain but are not, don't suffer because of it. There is a part of your brain, the insula, which if damaged, if you have a stroke or if there's a lesion there, you will, in the right place, you will feel the pain. But it's okay. These people, you know, they can have the dentist drill into their teeth and it's okay. It doesn't bother them. They know about it. If you, if you put uh, something hot on their hand, they know where you've put it. They know roughly how hot it is. They know everything that a normal person knows. But if it gets really hot, it's okay. I've done the following with a pain asymbolic. I take very cold Cokes out of the freezer. They're, they're half ice, they're half liquid. And I try to hold that Coke, can of Coke in my hand for as long as I can. 20 seconds is the maximum that I've been able to do. 20 seconds. And I'm pretty good with pain. The pain as asymbolic will take that can of Coke and hold it for as long as you want. It knows it's cold, it's freezing cold, it knows it's painful. But uh, it accepts that. And he'll get frostbite. No, not if th that's the important reason for doing this. That if the, that's why I said the can has to be partly ice but partly liquid. I don't want frostbite. But I mean, he will have the sequelae of the pain, the physical sequelae of the pain. Oh yeah, he'll even grimace. You'll see him. Uh, you, there are pictures of you. Uh, but it's okay. They'll they'll hold on to that. That's not a problem. And they claim that, that they don't feel the actual pain. So this is important to me, you see, because I want to be able to build a robot that actually feels pain. And the point is that these people are like those robots. I can build a robot that simulates pain, and this asymbolic grimaces and looks like it's in pain, but it doesn't, the pain doesn't have the same effect. The asymbolic is not to suffer. Suffering, yes. Is this model? Uh, it only deals with external inputs, or uh, then uh, it's all I'm de dealing with right now. But they are obviously, the inputs also come from inside. You can have a stomach ache. You can. There are many. Oh. Okay. Okay. So let's keep on going. So I'm going to start with extreme pain. Why extreme pain? Because it's very it's clearly uh, the biggest thing. So how does the body engineer the feeling? of extreme pain. So let me tell you that I have tried to understand this again and again and again, many different ways, which actually are not good. And finally, I came on a way to explain it to myself. And that may be completely the answer, I, I, I think. Make the machine unable to do anything except concentrate on the pain. That's it. You can't do anything else. All attention on the pain, this is extreme pain, take away free choice. Under severe pain, you can't do much else. Any processor that tries getting on the stage gets immediately pushed out by the pain. The pain is up there, it's got the highest weight, it refuses to let anything else into consciousness. When you are in extreme pain, you cannot think about anything else. 
You cannot play chess. You, you cannot do anything else. Here's some things that don't work to explain the pain, as attested to by asymbolics. You can talk about reactions. Like you could say, well, you know, when you touch something hot, your hand should pull away. Well, actually, the asymbolics, their hand does pull away. In fact, it doesn't even get up to the brain. The, the signal goes from the hand up to, to the spinal cord and back down to the hand. The hand pulls away. And if you look at the person, you know, okay, so th that reaction, you don't need that. The asymbolic is still perfectly conscious. Uh, the asymbolic generates sweat and their heart rate increases. The conductance, the skin conductance, changes the way it does for any person who actually, uh, you know, like you, who really feel pain. Uh, there, if it's really, uh, at some point, their <coughs> muscles may start to vibrate, and if it's really bad pain, you could have nausea, vomiting, all, all sorts of terrible things can happen. Uh, but none of that works because there are people who, these asymbolics, who, who have these properties, but they are not tortured by pain. I'm claiming that the torture is coming because nothing, you cannot think about anything when you're under severe pain. And the great thing about this, okay, great thing about this is you can actually test it. You can take a, an asymbolic and under pain, you can see if they can do something else. And they can play a perfectly wonderful game of chess, I can tell you. And they can beat me, even though they're under this extreme pain. Question? Yeah, uh, if you are screaming in pain, does it mean that you are trying to bring the audio to the stage? Or like, what would be the reaction? Like, Why would screaming be a reaction for pain? Uh, why would, I, I don't quite understand. So why would screaming, uh, screaming could be a reaction, I mean. There are these processors, and some unconscious processor is causing you to scream. People under great pain have been known to scream and not realize that they're, that they're under this pain. Not realize that they screamed. They're under pain, great pain, they scream. They don't even realize later that they actually screamed or whatever it was they were doing. This is done, a lot of this is done unconsciously. Okay, that's my explanation. For, for this pain. Uh, think, is loss of control enough? Think of the loss of control. Maybe this is what you were reading when uh, suffered when someone screams relentlessly into your ear. Except in this case, pain, you, yourself, your unconscious is screaming into your ear. Any questions here? Anyone want to argue about this? <laughs> Anyone have another suggestion? So, question. Yeah. I don't understand how it's a pain defined in this way is different from other kinds of involuntary loss of control, like sleep. Uh, well, well uh, the pain that, that, that you, first of all, you are, uh, if you're talking about sleep when you're not dreaming, yeah. there's nothing on the stage. But you have no free choice at that point either. So if, yeah, no if you're choice. defining pain as, uh, as yes, taking the away your free choice. Good point. So in this case, what's happening is there are all these unconscious processors that want to get up on the stage, and they cannot. The pain is preventing them from getting up on the stage. In the case of uh, Oliver Sacks, the fear was up on the stage, and it did not allow the pain to get through till he was well beyond the point where he didn't have to worry about the bull. He tore his ligaments while he was in the field, but he only when he got out did he suddenly realize the pain. It could not get up on the stage until the fear subsided. Well, you, you invited arguments. So I'll, I'll <coughs> sure. I think that, I, think that I, I agree with that being a first step, but in fact, if you're in a lot of pain, and you run into a lion or a tiger or your child is in, in jeopardy, you can still act. You can still act. So, yes. I, so I, that's, a, well, that's sort of a first step that needs some refinement. Well, well, you know, there are these numbers, and I don't quite know how to say it, but if pain and fear, if, if fear is greater or there's, than the pain, the, the fear will get up there. Nevertheless, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
there, I had this question of, you know, like with pain, is, what's the, you know, if you go into the doctor's office, they, ha they want to know how much pain you have, they, you can have pain between zero and ten. Uh, well, that's what we have right now, and the point is there's a maximum there. Is, is, right now, should I have, should there, there be a maximum to these integers? Should these integers be replaced by real numbers between zero and one, where there really is a maximum? Or uh, is it really integers which can go up and down to plus and minus infinity? Uh, so yeah, I told you, it's not completely defined. Yes? This only works with pain, right? Can there also be like, uh, does happiness take over? Yeah, yeah, we're going to get to that. Mm -hmm. Well, I did already say that, you know, joy and pain can subtract from each other. And uh, you can have pain, but greater joy will actually take care of the pain. But happiness over fear. What? Uh, but happiness over fear, joy over fear. Well, I, I don't know. It, it's what, uh, your body dis determines what these numbers should be, you know. We can get into how those numbers are determined to some extent, but I'm not telling you uh, exactly. Where are we here? Uh, how does the body engineer the feeling of pain? Small amounts of pain take away small amounts of free will, and large amounts of pain take away large amounts. And for confirmation on the <coughs> conditions that produce great pain, asymbolics think while normals cannot. Good. You, you know, this sort of thing, you can do lots of tests to check uh, out this thing, and I'm very interested in the ones that are confirmed, but also the ones that are not confirmed. Anyway, how to engineer fear, that's very much like pain. How to engineer joy. Um, so let me just say, I, I'm going to end very soon. How to engineer joy. It will not do to say the magic words insula striatum, which are the brain's reward centers, or the words dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, endorphins, happiness chemicals of the brain, because attaching a name to something doesn't generate understanding. I don't want that. It will not do to have a processor for joy do what a processor for pain does. You cannot explain joy the way you explain pain, because if the processor for joy gets up on the stage and doesn't let anything through, according to this, that's painful. So it cannot be that. Uh, because loss of freedom is painful, the explanation. So what does work? So here I've tried many, many different things to try to understand it. And one of them is success. Success in the world gives the unconscious processors responsible for that success the weight or the currency to get on the stage where it can be applauded. But, uh, you know, uh, applause can be generated consciously uh, or it can... But the, the one point here is, uh, by, by the way, uh, well, uh, let's keep on going. But how does a processor for joy getting on stage give the entity, by entity, the animal or the robot, uh, the experience of joy? Think, think in terms of the robot. Would that give the experience of joy? And uh, when the audience of processors, uh, unconscious processors, see which processor has won a competition. The applause gives added credit. But so what? How does that lead to joy? So I'm not accepting this, this wonderful explanation because I do know that success is really important. One possible answer is that in the absence of negative emotions such as pain, fear, embarrassment, and guilt, the body is in a natural state of joy. The Buddhists seem to think that. Uh, and if it's really, if you read Jill Bolte Taylor's My Stroke of Insight, where she has a stroke, and uh, on the left side, which controls speech, she talks about the fact that, wow, the world is one. She felt the joy of the world. It's a wonderful feeling she had, and she knew she had to call and get a, a, a uh, an ambulance because she was having a stroke. It was very hard to do that in this joyful uh, condition, but she managed to do that, fortunately. Uh, but the question for me is, is that jo state of joy the natural state of a robot? And I don't see why, why it should be. So 
here's uh, the solution I'm giving. In the case of intense pain, the conscious mind, of course, as I said, loses control over its thoughts. This means it cannot consciously modify the weights of its unconscious processors. This built in. In the case of great joy, on the other hand, the conscious mind thinks about whatever it wants to think about. Of course, the weights attached to processors fully determine what gets on stage, but in the case of joy, these weights can be modified to at least some extent by conscious attention. You can, in the case of great joy, think about other things, you can modify these weights. And attention, uh, to at least some extent, by conscious attention, and attention that is free to roam wherever thought and the environment might take it. This is built in. So I'm not claiming that this is how the human achieves joy, uh, but I think that a robot might possibly achieve joy in that way. Look, we're, almost, we're just about done here. Embarrassment, cravings, motivation. Well, motivation is so wonderful. Desire, you wanted to know about motivation. Motivation, desire plus energy. So there is a problem that some people have called uh, uh, left hemispatial neglect, where these people are not motivated to look at the left side of their world. They're simply not motivated and are unconscious of the left side of their world. This is a picture on the right drawn by a left hemispatial neglect patient. You see what's on the right is drawn, what's on the left is not. You put a plate of food in front of them, they'll eat the stuff on the right side, they will not eat the stuff on the left. And they're hungry. And they'll say they're hungry. And all you have to do is turn the plate around, and then they can eat. And you can <laughs> ask yourself, gee, he could have done that. Why didn't the, this patient just turn the plate around? The point is that that patient is unconscious of what's on the left side. They're not thinking of it because they are unconscious of that. Thanks. So that's my example of that. Open problems. Open problems. Oh, wow. Well, open problems. <laughs> uh, I, I would like to have a test for pain. I would like to have a test for the agony of pain. And I, I'll suggest one uh, right now. You know, the doctors don't have really have. You need an fMRI machine right now to be able to tell if the person's really in pain. And the doctors would like to know, is this guy complaining of shoulder pain because he really needs pain, uh, he really needs pills, or is he wanting pills so he can sell them? It would be nice to have a, a way to test. So here's something, I don't know how to turn this into a test, but notice <coughs> that this explanation of the agony of pain says that the person who feels the pain <coughs> cannot do anything else. So there's some sense in which there is a difference, the robot if that robot can do something else, it's not feeling the agony of pain. Okay, so that's the end. Uh, maybe a couple of questions. They, they need to be able to get out. Yeah, also people have been asking, so but if there are any questions left, uh, otherwise... Uh, you should thank Manuel for coming by. Oh, no, no, let's get two. Oh, let's, let's get, get three couple, questions. Yeah, let's get a couple of questions. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I actually like your last uh, issue. How do you tell whether you have pain? But if it's not much, then it doesn't take, take over the whole process. I mean, right, right. So how do you still tell? Well, I mean, you can still do things. You can still do things, but you can't do as much. The, the, the asymbolic beats me at chess. It plays as well at chess yeah. when there, uh, there's pain as when not. I'm claiming that the more pain you have, the less you So can how do you know what, the, what my normal level is? Yeah, I, I don't know. Right. Incomplete theory, I, I said. Yeah. Um, so I have a question about the loss of control um, with pain. How can you then... Ex Tyler. Yes. Um, how can you then explain um, sort of... Like, 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 like the story with the bull. Um, how do you explain not getting frozen because of pain? How do you explain uh, people having different strategies and reactions for the alleviation of pain when the pain is, you know, it's consuming their all, um, their, their, the entirety of their conscious thought uh, in both cases, but one person decides to, I don't know, uh, 
Sure. There are different, different things. Yeah. I think it's more for fear. So the response to fear is often either uh, uh, fight or flight or freeze. Those are the three responses. And uh, which one well, depends on that person and on a particular situation. Right. But like in the case of extreme pain, um, let's say you fall down and break your arm. Um, there are different coping strategies for how one would alleviate this arm pain. You could get up and try and go to the, try and find a phone, call the hospital. You could try and yeah. make a splint. Good point. According to this, if it's really extreme pain, you can't do anything. Okay, so you just like sit there mindlessly screaming because you, that's all you, you can comprehend. Can't do anything. Okay. Right. If you've ever torn a ligament, you may recognize this. It's not the worst. If you've ever had a kid. Yeah, we have some. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You made a distinction between feeling, really feeling pain versus simulating pain. And you propose that uh, not being able to do anything is pain. It's extreme pain. It's extreme pain. Why isn't it simulating pain? What's, I, why isn't this also a form of simulating? Because all, uh, no, I'm not saying it can't be simulating. I'm just saying that when you cannot do anything, when what's on the stage, that pain is the only thing the processors can pay attention to, that's pain. You're saying, I think the, the opposite, you're asking, well... Uh, what's the difference uh, between simulating pain and feeling pain? I'm not sure. Well, for example, uh, if the robot can do other things under this pain, then I would say it's, it's not really feeling the same agony. I think we have a question. Um, so you said uh, with your explanation for joy that that's not the way that, you know, you're not trying to say that that's the way the brain does it. And um, is that just for public consumption? In private, you would entertain some ideas on the relation between oh. your model and Oh, yeah, yeah, I'd love. <laughs> I'd love it. Yeah, yeah. This is where, where I am right now. Do I have the last answer? No. Because there may be very important things you could tell neuroscientists, and you probably know that, but um, you seem hesitant to make that leap. I do know that if I could get a good test for pain, the, the doctors would be very happy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Let me answer the question then for a while. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, wouldn't this robot consume too much power for it to be feasible? <laughs> Wouldn't this robot consume too much power in, in terms of energy? Uh, you know, uh, I don't, I don't, I, I'll skip that. <laughs> so, uh, the modeling of joy. So, you can model joy as, uh, uh, as a natural state, as you mentioned, and then use the unconscious processor as masks or something that will let the underlying jaw let through, then the extreme joy can be explained as these masks not being there at all or suppressed so that the entire joy comes through. Or any part of the emotions can be uh, amplified by <coughs> increasing the output of any of these uh, unconscious <coughs> Yeah, yeah. The, uh, OK. The problem I'm having is I don't know how I, I wanted to apply to a robot, and I don't know. Maybe that can be applied. I, I have to think about it. We're, we're going to stop here. Right. I'll, I'll be here. Thank you so much.